before I hand it over to our guest tonight, uh, I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you as a resident of Calgary uh, or Mokinstis in the language of the Black Confederacy, the Tutina, Stony Nakoda, Siksika, and Al Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, I'm a born and raised Calgarian, uh, and so I'm responsible to my obligations under Treaty 7. And as a descendant of European settlers, uh, I feel that I have a responsibility to atone for the mistakes or intentional harm of my ancestors. Um, through my work with AWA, I feel like I'm provided an opportunity to contribute in hopefully a meaningful way towards reconciliation as we seek to protect Alberta's wilderness uh, for current and future generations. We do this in partnership and collaboration with Indigenous peoples across the province. I hope you all take a moment to acknowledge the traditional lands from wherever you're joining us today and consider how you can make reconciliation an ongoing part of your lives. Now I'll introduce our speaker for the evening, uh, Kirby England, who is a wetland and riparian <laughs> ecologist and a full-time instructor at Lethbridge College in the School of Environmental Sciences. I was introduced to Kirby earlier this year when he kindly offered to assist us uh, myself, AWA Board President Jim Campbell, and Jim's friend Bob Patterson, uh, with shuttling us between Lethbridge and Fort McLeod at the end of our paddling adventure along the Old Man River. Uh, it was love at first, first sight after two hot days on the water, and he showed up with uh, cold beers for us. Uh, Kirby has been uh, recommended to us by a friend of AWA, Lauren Fitch, uh, and during our drive back to Fort McLeod, Kirby informed us of the many aspects of environmental consulting work. And I knew then and there he'd be a great connection and ally to our work at AWA. I appreciate Kirby taking the time to speak to us this evening and look forward to learning more about uh, beavers and wetlands. Uh, the floor is all yours, Kirby. Thanks. Thanks so much, Philip. So uh, as, as Philip said, my name is Kirby England. I am coming to you tonight from Lethbridge College. My form of an acknowledgement, I'd say, okay, this Tonitanical Kirby England, that's I'm Kirby England coming from Lethbridge College. And that's uh, how we would say it down here in Treaty 7 territory, homelands of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, I've been a faculty member of the college since about 2016, full-time instructor in, uh, in Visai. In addition to that, and this sort of came up a little bit with uh, Philip in our discussion, I'm the owner and principal consultant of U Betchella Environmental Inc., which is a um, company born entirely out of a desire to work alongside beavers. Uh, initially some very cool work done on a beaver dam analog integrated with some other technologies you'll learn about tonight in um, Starland County with a, a good friend Dara Kudris there. Uh, we've gone into some other environmental science consulting territory but really the applied human beaver coexistence and the uh, applied management side is what really drives the outfit. I want to thank you all for attending and I really do hope you have a few questions that come up during the course of the presentation. When one does come up, I understand you can just type that into the chat and um, we'll have some time at the end to address those questions. Also, if you just wanna hold on to those questions, uh, ask directly at the end, we're gonna open up the, uh, the room there for you to, uh, to pose your questions there. So our topic for this talk is of course beavers, which as you hopefully learn if you didn't already know, are really perhaps the best dam wetland managers on our landscape. However, the beavers management style really doesn't always agree with our own. And so how we might better coexist with beavers tonight in light of uh, seeking our shared management goals will be further covered. Um, in getting us to that topic, we'll also go through the ecology of beavers, the history of interactions with them as well. And with that, let's get started. So <clears throat> they say the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their proper name and to begin our wisdom sharing this evening. You'll want to know that the North American beaver wears the scientific name Castor canadensis, which links it both to the other living beaver species, which is Castor fiber, and also to Canada. Uh, as both the AWA, as Philip brought up there, and Lethbridge College are deeply committed to reconciliation and land acknowledgements, well, acknowledgements in general. I'm compelled to also say that uh, some of you probably already know beaver gistaki in the Nitstapi Blackfoot language. And where I'm originally from up in northern Alberta, our uh, Nihial Cree elders refer to the beavers there as a misc. Um, in these languages, for the record, down here I'd be a Napiquan, and uh, up north I'm a Munyao, lest someone get confused about my origins, which are also of, of European descent. <clears throat> so although it may feel for some folks like there are probably beavers everywhere already, 
Uh, here we have an indication of the probable historic range of beavers on our continent. Castor canadensis was by no means restricted to the true north strong and free. The only thing really keeping beavers from a full continental sweep seemed to be the unrelenting ice in the far north, endlessly arid conditions in some of the American Southwest, and of course where they're still prevented from occupying uh, by hungry alligators down in the Florida panhandle and the Keys. Uh, estimated with that previous distribution that we saw prior to European arrival, beaver numbers in North America were likely somewhere between 60 million and 400 million, which is to say we don't really know how many were here, but we know there were a lot. And with that uh, population density, beaver dams run all but the largest rivers and estimated to be in the density of anywhere from seven to 74 dams per kilometer of stream length on some of these systems. It's almost incomprehensible how much territory beavers tied up with their activity. In the first two and a half centuries of the fur trade, the number of beavers trapped annually increased. Big rivalries between the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Companies and some other independent trappers really further compounded the problem of over-trapping. Um, this competition caused many areas to be trapped out. Unfortunately, it was more out of spite and sort of a scorched earth tactic to deny the competitor a territory rather than an economic need or any particular market demand. At the close of the fur trade, North American beaver numbers had dropped to as few as perhaps 100,000 beavers all across the continent. The estimates I've heard for Canada were as few as 30,000 perhaps. Uh, beavers were totally extirpated, that is to say absent in many former trapping areas. Um, further, beaver dams and woody obstructions in streams were also removed to make way for watercraft. And with the absence of the beaver and their telltale dams, the way our watersheds looked and functioned would drastically change in only a matter of decades. <clears throat> so now that we've heard a little bit about beaver history, it's a good time to talk more about the critters themselves. Beavers are very much semi-aquatic mammals with one foot in the water and the other on land. And they're well adapted to this dual existence through a number of beneficial uh, evolutionary changes. Thanks to membranes and skin folds, water while the beaver is swimming is sealed out of their nose, their ear, and their mouth. It's sort of the way that uh, extra membrane layers close things off. Their furs made out of, uh, is pardon me, made water repellent with repeated applications of castor oil, uh, which is produced from glandular secretions by the beaver. To be clear, that isn't the same castor oil that some of you may also put in your hair. Fortunately, that castor oil comes from a seed but castorium and, and this oil that beavers use to uh, waterproof their fur are really, really quite effective. As we see here in the photo, the beaver uses a split toe on the rear foot to distribute those oils through their coat and, and brush itself waterproof. Beavers are experts at holding their breath, staying underwater for up to 15 minutes, using far less oxygen to fuel their brain than other mammals of comparable size. That broad, flat tail on a beaver is both a rudder and a propeller. It's also a great place to store energy to make it through that long winter. And finally, those webbed hind feet are really quite well specialized for swimming. On land and within submerged substrates, the beavers use their front feet, front paws, and these powerful digging claws to easily move soil. We can see the beaver picking up and carrying some soil there. Their prominent incisors, hence the handle bucktooth beavers, are used to cut down trees, peel bark off for eating. As you'll notice on our beaver here, it's actually the bottom teeth that protrude out in front of the lips rather than the top teeth, as nearly every cartoon of a beaver would have you believe. People are keen to give me beaver presents all the time, given that this is what I love studying and I have to kind of hold back. Well, it's not anatomically correct, but I appreciate the sentiment. So here we see those teeth, they're enriched with an iron, that's what gives it that orange hue. And they're harder on the front surface than on the back. And what that does is ensure that wear creates a constant sharp edge, which enables beaver to easily cut through wood. The teeth grow constantly through the beaver's life. And even when more easily gnawed offerings are available, if you were to supplement their diet with softer foods, the animals need to chew wood or some other bite resistant materials 
just to wear down those ever increasing incisors. There's, there's been stories of beavers in captivity that had been fed a diet of not hard enough material that their teeth actually grew up through their skull. And of course, uh, you can imagine how well they survived that. A beaver colony is, is what we would call a, a family of beavers. And it is very much a family operation. At its hub is a dominant adult female leading efforts to maintain the lodge, to cache winter food and to keep the dams functional. Generally, the adults, the beaver adults, form a monogamous relationship that persists until one of the pair dies. Having said that, a beaver divorce isn't entirely unheard of. Beavers breed in midwinter, and an average litter of four kits are born in the spring. The number of young born is generally related to food availability and the age of the female. Older beaver mothers typically have less offspring than younger ones. And a typical beaver colony contains an average of five to six individuals. You're going to have the adult pair, the kits of the year, and kits sometimes of the previous year. From a compilation of beaver family size and population estimates in uh, Novak's Guide to uh, <coughs> Wild Fur Bears, North American beaver mean group size can range from about 3.5 in the thinly populated Maritimes to 9.2 beavers per colony in the lower Yellowstone range should be noted that that high number was uh, prior to pre-wolf reintroduction. I should say prior to wolf reintroduction. Maybe slightly lower now, but certainly quite a range. We say in our part of the world, five on average, with that variation on either side. To prevent these beaver colonies from becoming too densely populated, typically the two-year-old beavers disperse out to form new colonies in the spring. And that's often coincident with periods of runoff and with high water, making travel in that aquatic medium just that much easier for these dispersing beavers. Um, beavers may move eight to 16 kilometers to find suitable conditions to reestablish, sort of on average. Although with some tagged beavers, I believe worked in in Pennsylvania, uh, they've been known to move an epic 236 kilometers, combining in water and overland travel. Some move one town over and some move two states over, it seems. Beavers mark their territories with the scent derived from those castor glands. Up to 100 scent markers on mounds are going to warn foreign dispersing beavers that a site is more or less taken. And every colony of beavers is highly territorial, making these colonies distinct and non-overlapping. The density of colonies is regulated by territories, and those are limited primarily by food availability or other conditions that can sometimes restrict a, a beaver population. Beaver densities in many jurisdictions average about one colony for every two kilometers of stream with suitable habitat. As part of my grad research uh, on beavers, we compared beaver colony density in and around the city of Saskatoon and found there that urban beavers had on average one colony per two and a half kilometers of river and their country cousins had one colony for every distance half of that. And so suffice it to say, it was quite an anomaly that the rural residents, beavers in this case, were even more crowded than the city folk. Not the way that usually goes. Um, it's also not the spacing of the beavers along the stream that is most remarkable, so much as what beavers do with water. In streams, the motive for dam building is really to impound water to create a depth sufficient for safe access to their lodge, for food caches, and an access over to a, a greater supply of trees and shrubs. Water depths stored behind the dams have to be sufficient for the beavers to allow movement under the ice from the lodge out to these food caches. I don't think we covered this earlier, but they're not hibernators. Beavers stay awake all winter. And so uh, they need to have sufficient underwater access out to the lodge. Uh, from the lodge to the food cache. And that's what the dam is really trying to do is pond back enough water to do so. Beavers will go out and create dams with whatever materials handy, tree branches, logs, grass, rocks, mud, bale wrap, a shopping cart one time. I pulled a kayak paddle out of a beaver dam recently. I don't know if that was intentional or not. Um, <clears throat> larger and less penetrable materials such as rocks in the dam are going to increase the hydraulic head from upstream to downstream of the dam, so a greater difference in height of the water, meaning more water is going to be stored above the dam versus allowed to pass below it. 
Uh, in a pinch, even cattails will be used for beaver damming when nothing else is available. Really anything that can be rolled, floated, or dragged is a suitable beaver building material in a pinch. And of course, lots of mud and substrate packed into the dam. Uh, tree branches and logs are what anchor the structure in. Well, sediment from the stream bottom upstream of the dam is used to glue the materials together. Excavating that substrate material also deepens the pond adjacent to the dam. So although these dams wouldn't by any means win a beauty contest or meet any sort of standard engineering protocol, they effectively capture and store water while also allowing some leakage to maintain these flows downstream. And it really isn't easy to categorize the structures that beavers build, although models do exist for types of beaver dams. Um, but they might really be considered wet dams. In the various states of beaver dams, water can sort of spill over the top, leaks through the main bulk of the dam and or seeps underneath through the dam. And there's, there's somewhat of an inescapable logic to having that leaky valve built in. That leaky dam just doesn't have as much pressure built up against it from the weight and the velocity of all the water held back. And so beavers in doing so have built safety valves in that somewhat release and reduce hydraulic pressures. And that welter of sticks and logs on the downstream face effectively dissipate much of the erosive energy of water spilling over and through the dam. So the base of the structure won't become undercut and unstable. Rather than falling vertically over a dam, water tends to run down and over a matrix of logs through the length of the dam and in doing so slows it down to just a trickle. There's a myriad of pathways for the water to take and rarely does it flow directly into the downstream channel. Of course, much of it also flows around the dam and increases floodplain connectivity. Often when we see a beaver dam, we'll see a series or succession of dams, what we'll call secondary dams or check dams, which are going to be built beyond upstream and sometimes flanking the primary one that impounds the water around the lodge. Those secondary dams and the extra water they hold back improve the transport of woody materials. They extend the safe swimming range of beavers and they ensure a better year round water supply. Um, they also serve as a bit of safety mechanism. If your primary dam is breached, they don't lose all the water right away. You've got those check dams to hold a little bit back while the beavers repair it. Uh, beyond the impounded water, beavers are going to excavate canals to transport food and dam building materials with more ease and safety. The entirety of these adjacent beaver dams and lodges, all associated with one active territory, is typically what we call a beaver complex. And so with shelter of the beaver explained, it's time now to change course to food here. The literal and, and anecdotal accounts of beaver diet would suggest that um, uh, beavers have a few favorites, and we'll talk about those more in a minute. Although most foraging is going to take place within 60 meters of water, beavers will forage up to 250 meters or so away from water if they must. But really the risks of predation and all the energy expense for this sort of waddling lumbering creature through foraging that further distance become too great than the net return of food energy at a certain point. And so beavers classically engage in what we call optimal foraging theory and they do well to find the right balance that maximizes fitness and reduces cost. And those beavers that do occasionally get it wrong with regards to foraging too far simply get eaten or starved to death. And so if that isn't survival of the fittest, I don't know what is. Hard way to learn a lesson. Um, although wood is, of course, prominent in a beaver's refrigerator in their cache, their diet is going to vary seasonably. Seasonally, I should say. <clears throat> although their choice of wood varies as well. Uh, literature and that human experience are both going to suggest trembling aspen, cottonwoods, poplars, the beaver favorite. And in many places, that does definitely appear to be the case. However, beavers also readily forage other members of the populous genus, uh, birch, soft maples, ash, pin cherry, choke cherry, variety of these native shrubs. And then they get into some less predictable picks, such as the spruce and pine, as well as the odd carragana or a Russian olive. Attempts have been made in some places to induce beavers to actually select for invasive woody species, such as salt cedar, but there wasn't great success from those trials, so it didn't totally pan out. In addition to woody foods, non-woody food items for the beaver include cattails, 
bulrushes, water lilies, pond weeds, duckweed, grasses, forbs, and sedges. And uh, for those beavers in captivity, um, many get to greatly delight uh, with these YouTube videos of beavers eating cabbage, eating carrots, eating a variety of other treats. And so it's uh, good to know they're a non-selective herbivore in some ways. Also, many woody species that beavers do forage on readily regenerate after beaver cutting. And so regenerated aspen shoots following beaver cutting will often develop these rather bitter compounds called glycosides. Oops, sorry, still uh, too still too long in my office here. <coughs> I'll, I'll speak more with my hands, I guess, so the room knows I'm here. Um, beavers will shift their diet away from those, those aspens that have become enriched in the glycosides um, onto larger stem diameters of other uncut woody plants. And that trend towards avoidance of certain species has been shown in natural systems. It's a little unclear what the role of human influence on the woody vegetation community through the planting of non-native trees and shrubs may be. And so that question itself was the topic of a bit of my graduate work. And in another presentation, I'd probably be happy to share more of that with you as well. But uh, we get into the weeds of, of introduced species pretty quickly. So we'll stay off that for now. Um, you should note that beaver cutting also readily stimulates vigorous sprouting of willow and, and some cottonwood species, and production of the woody biomass increases following beaver foraging. And for that reason, beaver and willows are sometimes called mutualists because of that overlap. They both benefit from the presence and activity of the other. These two species, beavers and willows, have co-evolved since time immemorial, and they're still part of a strong working partnership in our riparian areas. Here we see Liz Saunders, a, a colleague of mine, and actually the artist of my Ubetula logo, you'll see before too long, who uh, was some re-sprouted dense willow in a stand that may have been beaver foraged. And so in these aspen or poplar dominated systems, tree regrowth is, although not able to keep up sometimes at a rate that would sustain a beaver colony. And so after the suitable trees are eliminated and shrubs and whatever else, the beaver will move on. We call that a colonization and uh, departure cycle. Okay, and then often there's a recolonization later once that stand has regenerated. Uh, in many systems, though, the stands of trees and shrubs regenerate at a rate that doesn't actually require abandonment. And David Cooper, who's a well respected riparian ecologist from Colorado State, has said that a willow stand just four hectares in size, so hectares 100 meters by 100 meters, you have four of those, right, can sustain a beaver colony more or less indefinitely. Um, so it, it's not a huge amount of woody vegetation that, that's needed to maintain a beaver colony. Um, even with the dynamic nature of beaver activity through their flooding and their foraging behaviors, where the habitat's suitable, beavers are going to change the watershed. Uh, where there is potential, beavers could expand their range, and we've seen big range expansions into much of the former, former range. And even further than in some areas, because with the thawing of permafrost, we're now seeing further north expansion than previously observed. Um, although beavers are generally believed to go through these boom and bust cycles, there's more stability in many watersheds where colonies have persisted in the same location for over 30 years, sometimes up to 500 years colonies more or less occupying the same stretch of stream. Uh, that cyclic nature of beavers in their food was probably less pronounced before humans and cattle arrived on the scene, further shifting the balance. And in, in some areas like Wood Buffalo National Park, where we find the world's longest beaver dam at nearly a kilometer, it's estimated that that's been in progress for, you know, 20 or 30 years by multiple generations of beavers, so occupying the same area. Not a lot of folks in wood buffalo to compete with those beavers. Okay, so now that you understand a little bit more about beaver and what they're doing with their lives, I'd like to get a little further into why really they can be classified as the best dam wetland and riparian managers. A reminder that the beaver isn't an animal, it's an ecosystem, what we call a keystone species. For starters, <clears throat> beavers have a really long history in building up these riparian and wetland foundations. Traditional ecological knowledge from various First Nations groups will tell us that uh, beavers might have even pulled the first piece of earth up from the great depths of a prehistoric watery world. And in doing so, given the materials needed to start building up livable land from there. 
But whether or not that's the whole story, given the more recent and well-recorded 10,000 plus years of beaver dams successfully building upstream from lower reaches, repeating that process of old dams become filled with sediment, beavers have had and continue to have profound effects on changing the stream gradient, elevating the stream channel, changing cross-sectional valley profiles, and aiding riparian vegetation. Over time, beaver activity goes from changing a steep gradient stream, which we see in that figure one here, into a flatter stair-step one. It then widens the valley over time as that water sort of spreads out across the valley bottom. Um, <clears throat> deep, rich soils from centuries of sediment capture, sub-irrigated with that high water table from the pond, create these fertile valley bottoms that persist even with reduced beaver activity. And so we end up with these stream valleys that were once V-shaped and rather steep sloped as the glaciers eroded or retreated, I should say, formed and transformed into these wider U-shaped valleys with gentler gradients. Uh, research by Kim Green and Sherry Westbrook, Sherry being my graduate study supervisor, has shown that losing beaver from a watershed and breaching dams will cause erosion to increase and streams to down cut, which is gonna reverse that meadow formation process that had in some cases begun decades earlier. And of course, beaver ponds and, and wetlands are mother nature's natural water filters or the part of the kidneys of the earth, if you will. Okay, ponds are gonna trap and store sediment, improving that downstream water quality, reducing contaminants and others. Erosion, of course, is a natural phenomena on the land, but as our land use increases, that sediment load produced exceeds the range of natural variation by several orders of magnitude. The sources of this erosion are numerous. We're going to have roads, trails, cut blocks, cultivated fields, even livestock grazing in some cases along the stream banks, all contributing to excess sedimentation going into our waterways. But these beaver dams capture and store much of that sediment that's being washed down. The range being anywhere from 35 cubic meters to 6,500 cubic meters per pond. That's a, a large beaver pond and lots of sediment. At the upper end of 6,500 cubic meters, that represents basically 382 tandem dump truck loads of sediment that could be stored behind each beaver dam. Quite a service that we're being provided. A recent study from Devon in Southwest England, where beavers have been reintroduced after centuries of extirpation, um, monitored the water quality up and downstream from a series of beaver dams. And that work by Puttick et al. found significant differences in the amounts of suspended sediment below the beaver dam, as well as greatly reduced phosphorus and nitrogen. And this was followed up by some recent work by Dewey et al. Um, beaver dams overshadow climate extremes in controlling riparian hydrology and water quantity, where they showed again a 44% reduction in nitrogen in a tributary to the Colorado River in that state. So pretty clear beaver dams have a big role to play in reducing the sediment and the downstream passage of excess nutrient. Downstream of these ponds, as we said, 50 to 75% less suspended solids, 20 to 60% less phosphorus, 20 to 45% less nitrogen, up to 23% additional carbon sequestered and stored. And a big one here, reduced fecal coliforms. Uh, other studies have further confirmed similar findings, including those reduced fecal coliforms. We've actually had two situations down here in Lethbridge and just in Lethbridge County, we're in one case city stormwater and in another case a water treatment pond overflow being washed down a drainage where beaver dams now in place are actually serving to reduce that fecal coliform load to the Old Man River and that source of drinking water downstream. So it's, uh, it's great to advocate for beaver dams on the land and it's a much easier sell to managers when you can say, well, you can spend less on water treatment and I don't like drinking poo. Do you like drinking poo? No, well, Let's get some beaver dams on the land. And, and there you go. Okay. <clears throat> beavers, of course, with those dams are putting water in the bank. And beavers, of course, store water. There, there's no two ways about it. It's, it's a truism. And so nowhere is that storage of water better illustrated than in a report published by Dr. Glennis Hood, Suzanne Bailey in 2008 for the wood, mixed wood boreal region of East Central Alberta in and around Elk Island National Park. The series is actually called the Beaver Hills, coincidentally. <coughs> um, I'll miss, oh geez. 
So uh, beavers were, of course, completely eliminated from the landscape during the early 1900s. It's not far from Edmonton House, Fort Edmonton, right? So prime trapping territory in that part of the world. Um, but they've since been reduced, reintroduced. And what Dr. Hood and Suzanne Bailey did, or Doctors Hood and, and Suzanne Bailey did, was to examine and compare aerial photography of the region during two really severe drought periods, so 1950 prior to beaver reintroduction and 2002 post beaver reintroduction. And what they found was quite dramatic. They noticed that in 2002, even though this was a far more severe drought year than in 1950, the renewed presence of beavers on the landscape was associated with a nine-fold increase in open water area. And the conclusion there, of course, is that beavers have a dramatic influence on the amount of open water at a landscape level even more so than temperature, precipitation, weather patterns, and other climatic variables that were analyzed in that research. Beavers were the player in increasing that, that water storage. And the way they did it is, of course, by changing the depth and, and the overall surface area of a lot of these beaver ponds. And so in addition to the main body of the pond that the beaver forms, what they do is they excavate these canals that are in some cases hundreds of meters long cumulatively. They could be half meter wide, some up to three meters wide, and anywhere from a half meter to three quarters of a meter deep. Some, as I found out the hard way and many of my you know, former and, and uh, colleagues at Cows and Fish found out the hard way, some up to about a meter and a half deep or more. You think, oh, I'm just going to step over this thing and... Uh, you don't, and then you think, well, it won't be much of a fall, and then it is, and, and you're in past your chest waders and, and uh, in for a bit of a, a day-long soak at that point. But you're spending time in a beaver habitat, so life could be much, much worse, of course. And then that ponded water we see in the water in the canals is really only the water that we can see. Beneath the pond, an adjacent uh, area is totally a different story. We can multiply that surface water we see stored by about five to 10 times to get a picture of the total groundwater storage increase as a result of a beaver complex on the landscape. And that groundwater storage can extend hundreds of meters laterally, so out into the adjacent riparian area and the water table there, and three to 600 meters downstream of the beaver dam. So a huge increase in total groundwater storage with beavers on the land. The potential influence of about a 2,000 meter square beaver pond could exceed a square kilometer. So it's uh, really quite impressive. And so these ponds and canals, as we've said, impound water, raise the water table, increase the soil water interface, increase the duration of water contact. They'll increase potential overbank flooding because the water's already that much higher. And really, they'll increase time that water spends in the floodplain. It's initiating a cycle of water retention, water detention, water storage, and a much slower downstream release. And that's really important in flood mitigation, which we'll talk about a little bit here. So. What beaver ponds are doing, dams and ponds, is they're checking velocity of streams. They're dissipating some of that water energy laterally as it flows. And that really decreases the risk and also the cost of major flooding and will slow down some erosion. A series of beaver dams on the landscape can increase the size of that effective floodplain up to about 12 times. And so you imagine, you know, you get a big precipitation event, water's coming downstream. There's lots more area for it to spread out over rather than just that narrow channel that it's rushing down quickly on the way to Calgary, as, as Philip said. Uh, he's born and raised it. And so a single beaver dam, right, can have the same effect on the floodplain width as the area that a one in 200 year flood event would cover. So really quite a lot of movement of water out of the channel and into the adjacent floodplain. And so in that Devon, England study that I'd mentioned a bit earlier, a complex of 13 beaver dams were shown to reduce peak discharge by 19% and total discharges by 9% during a storm event. And that may not seem all that significant, but you imagine it, you know, nearly a fifth reduction in the magnitude of a discharge event could be the difference between a devastating flood and, and just a heavy downpour and, and flow. And we've seen other uh, similar work done by uh, Sherry Westbrook's lab uh, in, in the Kananaskis area, looking at the flood attenuation benefits of beavers. 
And so Sherry and her students here studied 74 beaver dams immediately after the 2013 K Country flood, which was of course the, the Calgary flood. The results from this study were relatively recently published, contrary to what many thought would happen, rather than this unprecedented flood simply blowing beaver dams all apart. What Dr. Westbrook reported was that 68 of the beaver dam systems were still intact or partially intact after the flood. And so given that each beaver pond stores on average 4,000 cubic meters of water, with four of the largest ponds, they had their holding a combined value of nearly 20,000 cubic meters of water. Those beaver ponds did in fact, or certainly can in fact, delay the downstream transmission of flood water. So rather than all showing up one day on say, June 13th-ish, I think that was, um, it could be over the course of several weeks. <clears throat> I was actually in that lab group at the U of S and it was interesting to hear about, you know, the, the roads are washing out and everyone's stranded and they said, well, you got to look at the sunny side. You're going to be in a perfect position to collect some really interesting flood data. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's a good spin on it. Okay. One other benefit of course of beaver ponds is they're out there really controlling the thermostat in and around our aquatic ecosystems. And because they're storing that water underground, it's cooler it's released at a slower rate back to the channel. And that's gonna keep that uh, water temperature cooler in summer, warmer in the winter, to the benefit, of course, to these uh, local native trout, such as our friend, the cutthroat here. There's that lag between the time water enters the pond, it's absorbed as groundwater, and it's eventual release. That lag can be three months. And so that's really gonna benefit native trout later on in the summer when you know they're stuck with the heat dome sitting over top. And beavers control the thermostat in another way. Talk about turning it up even hotter here. We'll see, hopefully my video will play. I'll let Dr. Emily Fairfax, an eco-hydrologist, give you a little demonstration of how beavers can help. You're not missing much on the sound here. Although I suppose I could share. So there we are. They're okay. That beaver created wetland is okay. <coughs> and this isn't just a cute animation. So Emily and her colleagues, Dr. Fairfax and her colleagues, recently compared the width of a burned riparian corridor in beaver dammed and undammed reaches of various streams in the Western United States where wildfires have been recently burning. And what they found with that work is that where there are beaver dams, there's noticeably wider unburned riparian corridors. And we see just that, you know, across the creek comparison here, undammed versus dammed. And so it's gone so far as now referring to uh, this animal as Smokey the Beaver. This was the name of the paper, actually, which you got to give her mad credit for that. Smokey the Beaver, Beaver Dam Riparian Corridor, stay green during wildfire. And that's what we see, right? In streams without beavers, those drought conditions, right? Vegetation dies back, fire comes in, that dry vegetation ignites and burns. Really, the only spot saved is that narrow little bit of stream channel. In streams with beavers, where we have that deep water table, we just talked about all the increased water available around a pond, you don't have the big uh, encroachment of dead, dried out vegetation. And even under fire, you don't see as much burned up stream corridor. And in some cases, they're sort of relying on beaver dams and beaver streams as water breaks. And there's a lot of fire breaks, I should say. There's lots of uh, uh, money being spent in the United States looking at beaver as really a climate change savior and working beaver into management strategies for, uh, for fire prevention and other things. So good to see that our, our wetland manager is getting their due. Um, and then, of course, those unburned ribbons of riparian habitat become essential, critical refuges for wildlife. Even in the absence of fire on the landscape, beaver wetland complexes are biodiversity hotspots. Beaver workings contribute substantially to the complexity, connectivity, and vegetation diversity of these landscapes, which, of course, translates to many more opportunities 
for wildlife species on, near, and beneath the surface of beaver ponds. Those beaver ponds create unique habitat for numerous wildlife species from fish to frogs to invertebrates to a variety of birds and even ungulates like we see our, our uh, old patron of the beaver pond, the moose here. Sort of a vintage slide here reminding us that riparian areas are a magnet for fish and wildlife. 80% of fish and wildlife populations depend on that 2% of the landscape that is a riparian area. And that beaver population, of course, enhances that 2%. So if a single beaver pond is good, right, many improve the situation across the watershed, increase the ability of beavers to persist, also enhance that larger benefit package that goes along with a beaver dam and a beaver dam complex. There's potential for more beavers and their benefits in the foothills and in the parkland, as well as the grasslands and even up in the boreal forest. Unfortunately, of course, with all the good potential benefits of beavers out on the land, also comes a potential for some of the bad living alongside this species. These watershed superheroes can still be pesky rodents that really do have a knack for plugging up culverts, for flooding roads, and of course, for cutting down some of our precious trees, especially around the grassland where trees are often few and far between. We really take it personally in some cases when beavers start foraging in them. And so our traditional response to this pesky nuisance has been pretty heavy handed. Guns, traps, dynamite, backhoes, these are all big operations. My dad was actually a fish and life officer in Alberta for a brief 36 year stint. And so you can imagine I've heard of and uh, seen my fair share of beavers being lethally managed. Governments still actively promote lethal beaver management, so much so that in some counties in both Alberta and in Saskatchewan, there continues to be beaver bounties in place to rid us of this menacing creature. But as you'll recall from an earlier slide, beavers are a rodent that breeds early in their life cycle, relatively speaking. They breed yearly. They produce several kits, which are expelled from the colony every spring. These hardworking beaver parents provide their offspring with the resources and the skills to get a really good start in life when they leave the complex around two years old. And in addition to the parents and the young of the year at the colony still being present, remember those two-year-old beavers begin dispersing, can travel hundreds of kilometers in order to find suitable habitat not occupied by another beaver territory. And when they do find a seemingly suitable spot, they often immediately try to set up shop by building dams, trying to secure a water depth as well as foraging in the surrounding area for food and building supplies. And really what is a road with an unblocked culvert, if not a dam that's 95% of the way already built for the beaver? And your yard or property full of these native or planted trees, really what is it if not just a beaver lumber yard? It's a dated reference. Problem wildlife behavior ensues or what we perceive to be problem wildlife behavior. You may pre, uh, proceed to propose even more use of guns traps, dynamites, and or heavy equipment. But really that only buys you a bit more time without an active beaver in the area. And with no territoriality established there, you'll probably end up with a beaver turf war next time dispersers do arrive. Beginning to bang your head against the wall here. So the lethal solution alone really doesn't solve the problem. It certainly isn't allowing for beavers to be pre present and to do all the beneficial things we've already covered. And so, What's the alternative? Well, in short, the answer is beaver coexistence. We need to start trying to see beavers as our watershed management partners rather than our enemy. And there are ways to work with beaver rather than constantly fight nature by trying to work against them. These are the original wetland and riparian area managers. We came after the fact and are just sort of adapting to it. Rather than fight against the original, let's work with them, okay? And there are ways, of course, to work with beaver rather than fight. One of the main organizations I've found, and of course, many of us have found, dedicated to sharing information on beaver management and training these beaver management, uh, beaver wetland professionals, is this not-for-profit Beaver Institute. And I'll admit their early guidance and their resources, hugely beneficial in my research and now in my professional beaver flood and forage prevention work. And there's getting to be a community of folks looking to work with beaver, for better habitat naturally, these beaver believers seeking a way to coexist. Uh, my graduate work at the U of S was actually initiated by the perceived foraging problems 
of urban beavers in the city of Saskatoon, the recognition, the coexistence there through the use of tree wrapping, which we also call non-lethal deterrence, could be a technique to retain the benefits of beavers, but minimize the effect of their problematic behaviors. It's a large river, so they're not damming, but the big concern there was beaver foraging. We know, of course, that beavers play this role in the disturbance regime of forests and the regeneration cycle, but they also happen to occasionally, of course, chew down trees we want to keep in our cities. And so the obvious choice, as is done in many jurisdictions, was rather than trying to just get rid of all the beavers, it was to take away for the opportunity for those beavers to forage down all the trees we'd rather that they did it, which entered wire wrapping. And our research in Saskatoon really was looking at the most cost effective beaver deterring and beaver friendly solutions. And you see a, some former colleagues of mine and, and friends that assisted me on that research and uh, some world class beaver photos come out of Saskatoon via Mike Digo, who uh, this photo is from and others in this presentation. What we found, of course, was the guidelines for proper wire wrapping were well provided in the Beaver Restoration Guidebook, which is a U.S. Forest Service publication. And our work further showed, for the most part, the recommendations of sort of a minimum 4x4 spacing was adequate. But in some cases, 2x4 spacing, which we did observe, uh, beavers would kind of rake their teeth against the trunks down the long edge. And so we recommended 2x2 two two or 1x1 one one stucco, in some cases stucco wire, is quite an affordable and effective solution. And, and also the reminder to extend these cages at least two or so feet above your height of expected snow load, because we did find several trees on that work that there was a cage in place. They hadn't forged through the cage. The beavers just waited until the water was open and they could come up on the land and walk over the snow to eat the tree right off the top. So that was something that was observed. Um, I've since gone on from that work to form this company I referred to earlier called You Betchel Environmental, really to do other beaver coexistence installations elsewhere. Um, a few years ago, when I kind of first started this, I even had my former beaver removing father pictured here, help me out in some design and installation of these sorts of flood prevention structures. Um, at You Betchel, of course, we really look forward to working more in the future with other private landowners. We've had a few, some even in Southern Alberta, which has been great. Municipalities, developers, and parks on their path towards beaver coexistence. The technology's out there, um, the material's there. It's just a matter in many cases of getting someone who can walk you through some of the permitting process and, uh, and apply some of that hands-on labor to, to the process. Um, here, what we have are a couple fence and pipe systems as they're known, sort of what's called a beaver pond leveler. Uh, which allows for draining of water through a beaver pond, but the intake is far enough back and submerged underwater that the beavers don't actually hear water running into it. So they ignore the intake. They dam onto the fence, which is around the culvert, but you've piped through that. And that's what we're seeing here, two fence and pipe systems. Um, one on the left is two years post-install. The one on the right is a year post-install. But in both cases, lots of beaver redamming effort, uh, more so on this one than on this one. Um, but really no further maintenance functioning is intended. We're maintaining the benefit of that beaver wetland and we're not getting the cost. And in this case, well, both of these cases, it was that uh, these are large roads adjacent to these large culverts that would be washed out many times in the spring and require larger and larger equipment to come in and try and clear out these dams. And so this is work I did in Clearwater County and uh, you know, proud to say there's some, some great converts in that area that have seen the, the light of coexistence and it's just a matter of getting more of these installed and sort of flood proofing, uh, beaver flood proofing that is, much of the landscape. And so beaver coexistence done properly really is both cost effective and environmentally beneficial work. The materials aren't particularly high tech. The process is a little bit labor intensive. Uh, successful installations require some experience with construction, a bit of destruction of dams mostly, some moving of awkward loads, getting creative to solve these little challenges that do come up during an installation. Here we had, uh, how do you get the pipes through this beaver wetland so dense you couldn't dare walk through it? Well, just float them up the channel, which worked pretty good until we went to run the rapids uh, upstream, down through some beaver dams, and those pipes started to fill with water. But uh, fortunately, you know, when you uh, get in these situations, it, it requires a healthy amount of really not worrying about getting soaked through 
when those pawns turn out far deeper than you initially thought. And also, of course, having your physically fit friends join you to help with the install. Always really good idea as well. Thanks here to Corey, Kelly, Anthony, Brent, others that have helped me in these uh, installs along the way. Um, the idea of proactive coexistence now and flood prevention is even catching on. And so here what we have is a fence and pipe system integrated into a new bridge replacement project, um, even before the crossing itself was operational. So it was sort of a new and interesting experience to do these installs without the stream flowing or the pond. Um, and although the footing was a bit easier, I certainly did miss the cooling effect of having water around you while you're working. But it's good to see, you know, we're getting into these types of installations now. And so remember, although the beaver tireless maintenance worker that they are won't always see the good you're trying to do for them. And instead, they might make a counter move to your initial coexistence effort. But with any coexistence install, you plan on those maintenance things, you plan on some adjustments being made. Those two are all part of the process and really just another little problem to solve without wishfully hoping to try and permanently solve the problem beaver problem by killing them off for good. Remember, there's no such thing. Uh, they're not problem beavers generally. They're just a problematic situation with an easier solution. At the end of the day, really, we can live alongside beavers and we can reap all the benefits from the original riparian and wetland manager, the best damn one at it uh, that they have to offer us. And so I hope you've been partially inspired here to consider how you might contribute to beaver coexistence efforts if you haven't already been doing so. And with that, I'm gonna wish you a friendly slap of the tail on the water, signal my exit from this portion of the presentation. Thanks, just a few acknowledgements here. Awesome, thanks so much, Kirby, that was great. Um, in terms of uh, questions, um, oh, I was gonna say, we didn't have anything in the chat. So if people want to post into the chat, if they're more comfortable that way, um, feel free to enter your questions into the chat or uh, Kirby is more than happy to take questions from the floor. If anyone wants to turn their video on and speak, uh, I would ask if you know how um, to maybe use the raised hand reaction on Zoom, uh, it would just be helpful instead of just having to <laughs> just sort of shout from the floor. Thanks. Oh, I see there's one in the chat here. Kirby, can you repeat the density of beaver colony in urban versus rural around Saskatoon? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I can scroll back to it and maybe I should just so I'm confident, but um, I'll share the link to that paper as well. <coughs> it was, um, uh, <coughs> pardon me. It was not on a slide I'm finding. Sorry, there it is. Um, no, it's not. I blew it. That's okay. I'll, I'll go back to my question slide at the end. We had uh, one colony per 2.5 kilometers of stream uh, in the city. And we had basically half of that. No, in, yeah, in the city and basically half of that in the rural area. So it was one colony per basically one point. Uh, that be two, boy, this is bad when you can't do two and a half divided by two in your head. It's been a long day, sorry. 1.25 kilometers uh, of stream on average. And, and there's of course varying beaver density numbers um, that Novak et al, uh, 1987, here it is right here, is one of my favorite you know, beaver compilation articles, even with you know, wonderful beaver artwork on the, the chapter cover. And, and they cite beaver uh, densities at varying values. Interestingly, some of the highest beaver population density they found now is in the Seattle, where there are two colonies per one kilometer of, uh, of habitat there. So really a high density of animals. On another large prairie river, this is still in, in uh, progress, so I shouldn't report it you know, to the specifics, but another large-ish city on a prairie river, we're at about 0 0.6 beaver lodges per kilometer. So uh, on the lower side. Awesome. Thanks, Kirby. I've sure. seen actually, uh, I've seen plenty of beavers lately along the Bow River in Calgary, more than I think I've ever seen, um, which is cool. I don't know what's causing that, but it's nice to see. Yeah. Um, the next was a, uh, not so much a question, uh, but actually something that I was thinking about during this discussion. Uh, it says here, beavers are pictured on our Canadian nickel. Uh, any comments? And, sure. and from, my, from myself also, it's funny, I was thinking that as you were talking, like our 
our sort of one of our national animals or the, the national animal is something we tried so hard to extirpate. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a fascinating one. And so Glynis Hood has done a really good job in her Beaver Manifesto book talking about Canada's real love-hate relationship with beavers. And of course, in a longer version of this presentation, I get more into that sort of history. And, and they're sort of something that's both um, revered and, and vile. We, we love beavers when they're cute and charismatic and they're a symbol of Canadian industriousness and uh, economy and other things. But then of course, when they become in any way perceived to be a problem, um, we do all our best that we can to quickly dispose of all the beavers in the area. And as we talked about, you know, it's been said many times that Canada really only exists in the way it does as a country because of these beavers, right? That was the draw of, of Europeans to this territory in many cases. Yeah, they fished the Grand Banks for salt cod, but uh, what brought them inland was, was that beaver population and others. So it's, it's interesting. For a while, the Royal Canadian Mint had a, a commemorative beaver coin, which cost $50. And I was trying to convince my wife and others, you know, this would make a really nice present and on and on and on. And of course, you know what they did for me, right? Nickels. I just got given nickels. They said, there you go. There's your beaver. It was cheaper. And, and what's interesting too, is I've heard recently that we've scrapped the penny because of such low use. And there's threats of scrapping the nickel now from the mint because it's the next least used currency. And, and so, uh, I hope not, because it's yeah. a good reminder for Canadians of the importance of the beaver. Although somewhat, you know, it's our lowest denomination now. So maybe that isn't a good message that we're sending. Yeah. A um, couple more questions here in the chat now. Uh, is there a primary limiting factor for what uh, a beaver will dam? Like, is it a velocity, velocity issue, a stream width thing? Yeah, I haven't done as much work on the hydraulics of that. I think more or less it's that um, it is velocity and width, and it's trying on, on streams of a certain size. You know, they, they start the dam at the bottom of the channel, right? They build up from there. And, and, of course, that is your slowest moving water down at the bottom and on the sides. But if you get into a large enough system, that water is still moving fast enough that it sweeps away those initial logs and other things that they're trying to get started with. And so... I think that seems to be the issue. Um, I would say velocity more than width because I've certainly seen some uh, beaver dams built on wide, shallow channels. And, and of course we referenced the longest beaver dam in the world is nearly a kilometer now, 900 meters. So I don't think it's width. I think it would be more of a, a velocity factor. And, and this is a time when my office mate's a hydrogeologist and I, I wish that he was here to speak more to that aspect of it. Yeah, thanks. I, uh, I'm going to have to do some Googling about that, uh, like a one kilometer beaver dam. I, I yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty neat. And the funny thing you mentioned Googling, the guy who found it just recreationally scanned Google Earth as his hobby. And he looked around for interesting things. And oh, wow. he was doing that in Wood Buffalo National Park of all places and saw, well, what's this big long line that I've never seen something like this before? And then did some more digging and looked at the past history, as you can do, and saw oh, this thing's taking form. And so it's uh, it's pretty neat. I think it would be more of a destination for beaver fans, but uh, it, it would take a helicopter ride and some real heavy duty bushwhacking. So yeah. not a lot of folks are ever going to go see it. It's on my bucket list. Um, next question here was, what does uh, hardscaping along the river edges, um, like flood mitigation mean yeah. for beavers? Can they work around that or do they need to move on? Rip wrapping, I think is yeah. kind of what we're getting at there. Yeah, so uh, from Saskatoon, we saw lots of that, of course. And beaver, for as clumsy as they are, they're persistent in their rock climbing efforts. So we saw some situations where they'd cleared out the forest or a flood had cleared it, whatever it was. They hardscaped for 20 or 30 meters, but then there was still a vegetation community behind it. The beaver would sort of awkwardly climb and tumble over that riprap to get to the trees behind and try and drag things back over the rocks. So it's not to say that it's an impenetrable barrier to beaver foraging. 
Um, but certainly, of course, you're reducing your vegetation cover. So they're just going to have to forage further inland. And that's one of the things, you know, why we suggested the density in Saskatoon was likely that much lower, was just the number of hard surfaces. So they, they had to have a larger territory just to get the amount of suitable food that they required. Yeah. But yeah, again, we didn't test that thoroughly. That was just a hypothesis. Um, there were a couple of questions just that uh, people who are wondering about the recording, it's going to be made public. Um, uh, we'll make sure that a newsletter goes out or an update just so sure. people know that that's uh, available. Um, next question here, we'll do a few more. We're just over eight, but I think yeah. uh, we'll do a couple more here. Um, what is the best document to give a landowner who doesn't understand why they should tolerate beavers? Is there an educational document um, that, that's like uh, available for that? Yeah, so this will will lean back on cows and fish um, has done some excellent work. The Mistaki Institute has done some excellent work as well. Um, Carrie O'Shaughnessy, I think I saw this in the meeting. I'm just blanking. It, the Pond of Gold was the earlier version of the newsletter, but then they've got a larger beaver pamphlet, which I have around here somewhere, but of course can't think of the name right now. Um, so I think when we post this to YouTube, we'll make some show notes. And in that we'll link the, uh, the, the beaver coexistence document. Yeah, that Carrie, Carrie's here. What's it called, Carrie? Beaver's Beaver watershed partner. partner. Ha! See, soon as I said, what's it called, I knew it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And it's around here somewhere. That's a really good one. So I think uh, cows and fish would be happy to have you distribute that resource. I'll even give sure. you a printed copy for those folks that like reading things that are printed on something. Um, yeah, can you access recordings? Yes. Yeah. Uh, doing anything with the Southwest US efforts by some, oh yeah. So there have been beaver reintroduced, sorry, Philip, I started. No, no, I'll get, I'll get, just read myself. out the, if you want to read it out um, before you the, answer. Just this, so others... this is my uh, instructor coming out in me. I'm monitoring my own chat. So no Jim asked, doing anything with the Southwest US efforts by some to introduce beavers to help through drought wildfires. Yes, they've done reintroductions into Nevada and other jurisdictions. Um, some great, I mean, just like, transformative pictures of just this dry caked barren landscape that in as few as a few years and some now 15 20 years later is just a oasis in the desert as a result of beaver reintroduction there reintroduction's tough a lot of jurisdictions ours included won't really let you move beavers easily uh, because of that long held belief that beavers uh, perhaps because of this i'm not speculating too wildly um beavers are a problem there's not a lot of willingness to move a problem potentially from here to elsewhere so there hasn't been as much beaver reintroduction as could be possible but of course beaver reintroduction into areas is nothing new we, we did it to bring back the stocks initially then they sort of reached a, a high and now there's some hesitance to move them into new areas but of course with all the benefits we're seeing from Smokey the beaver I think it's going to become much more standard and um as in many cases, of course, the traditional knowledge keepers, uh, the First Nations groups that have slightly different regulations with regards to moving animals on their land often lead the charge in reintroducing beavers into ecosystems that they've been removed from, what they call beaver restoration. So the Tallulah tribes in Washington um, and others in Montana, even the Omscopi Pecani down in, in uh, like around Browning, they're working on beaver reintroduction and beaver dam analogs and other things. So it's... Uh, it's becoming much more common. Um, let's just say I've been working on my live trapping with my fingers crossed that a day will come in the future that uh, I'm going to be called upon to help move beavers into these sites. I'm working on beaver coexistence. Let's go. How do beavers survive living in large rivers like the North Saskatchewan River, uh, where spring high waters must remove flood piles? Yeah, they, piles, piles. they certainly do. And so that's one of the things that will kind of wipe out a beaver colony. It's called ice scouring, of course, those high waters. And often when that ice and the breakup flows, it'll just kind of whoop, wipe those colonies right off. The hope is that the beaver is sort of living back in the bank and they don't get carried off with the, with the kind of armored bank colony. And then the second hope there is that, well, if the water's flowing well enough, to carry the lodge away, then hopefully the beaver can sort of get out into the channel and back up onto land to start foraging. And they're not as reliant on that winter food cache. And then what you'll notice in Calgary, as Philip pointed out in Edmonton, I certainly saw, I see it in Lethbridge too. In our urban areas, we often have water treatment plants, which of course keep water open. 
in Saskatoon, it was water treatment and hydroelectric generation on the north end of town. So there are two things keeping the channel open there and beavers would sort of be active all winter and, and getting out and not relying on a winter food cache, more foraging on, uh, on standing vegetation that wasn't stored under the ice. So um, someone asked, what's my take on what's going on in Airdrie right now? Well, um, I've reached out to the town of Airdrie uh, sort of offering my services as a, uh, a beaver specialist of sorts and a professional biologist. I uh, haven't heard anything back yet. I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's a situation where an independent review by a, a wildlife sort of coexistence specialist is definitely warranted. And so I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about that resolution. Um, someone asked Wayne here, uh, very interested in fish passage. Are you aware of success in having fish moving back and forth successfully? Um, certainly fish move back and forth successfully readily across beaver dams. That's been long documented. Um, uh, salmon really thrive in beaver ponds. Uh, young salmon thrive in beaver ponds and beaver are sort of a champion of salmon restoration in Washington and Oregon and other jurisdictions. One thing that I want to look at more, which hasn't been as readily studied, is, okay, we know the beavers move across the dam. How do they move across pond levelers, um, which is sort of the pipe and the, the uh, cage I've talked about installing. And so I've got a research grant and development, and we're hoping to start this work next summer, where we're going to install a series of pond levelers um, in a, a human-modified channel that has beavers and has fish. And then we're going to tag some of those fish with little radio transponders. And then we're going to put a raise on the pond leveler that when the fish swims through, it will signal, yes, it went through the pond leveler pipe or no, it went around the pond leveler pipe. And with that, we're hoping to get a good answer of are fish able to successfully navigate through these. Um, anecdotally, I helped install a pond leveler in Fish Creek Park in Calgary with uh, Adrian Nelson and, and the Friends of Fish Creek um, Provincial Park Society. And within days, they reported that they couldn't speak to fish. There weren't many fish in the channel, but the mink absolutely loved the pond leveler and they treated it like a water slide. They'd swim to the intake, get in it, and then a second later, they're shooting out the outlet. And they figured out here's safe underwater passage done more quickly uh, without fear of predators and others. So. I can't speak to fish, but I can speak to mink as, as loving fish passage or loving a passage through a pond leveler. Um, okay. Uh, yes, good good shout out to cows and fish. Definitely cows and fish where I got my start. I think a slide or two ago in my um, uh, in my acknowledgements and I, I sort of skimmed over that. Uh-oh, and I've skimmed over my whole presentation. Um, of course, our, our cows and fishers Cows and fish, Lauren Fitch, of course, professional biologist, Catherine Hall, some cows and fishers. A big thank you to all the folks on this list. And, and I certainly wouldn't be here today if it weren't for these two biologists towards the bottom. Some of you already know. And, and Carrie, who's in the meeting too on that list as well, of course. Um, let's keep going down. 20 new messages. We get to keep up. Carrie shared the link to the Beavers, our watershed partner. Uh, big concerns in Colorado regarding water rights and beavers. It's heating up. Yeah. Uh, a little nervous where this may land. Trout Unlimited is working on saying their historical extent should guide where they will be allowed tricky. Who will prove where they were historically a new profession? That's tricky. But what I can say is, interestingly, um, what we have is Dr. Fairfax and others have now gone to sort of answer this question. They're looking for beaver fossils in ponds over time. And, and of course, sampling for that. And that'll give a little better indication of where the full range of beaver was historically. Now, I didn't get into this presentation just for lack of time, but there was a beaver ancestor called Castoroides ohioensis, which looked a lot like a beaver, but was about two meters in length and weighed several hundred pounds. It's about the size of a black bear. Um, they may go out looking for beaver fossils and find some mega beaver fossils and say, not only were beaver here, they were huge. Yeah. It's a relative. Uh, they weren't as much of a dam builder, more of like a large sort of uh, freshwater hippopotamus, you could sort of think of them as. There we go. Wonderful. And, and of course, thank you all for attending. It's always my pleasure. Yeah, we had a good turnout. I don't know what our total was, but I saw we were about 60 at one point. So that's there amazing. you go. They told yeah. me 67 was the number to beat. So yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> Let's say it was 68. Okay, no. Uh, okay, yeah, it looks like uh, it looks like we're good. So yeah, thank you everyone for for attending today. Thank you, Kirby, again. This has been great. Of course. Uh, and yeah, 
looking looking forward to uh, future uh, future work we may get to do together. Yeah, definitely. Me too. Thanks, Phil, and everyone Thanks. else. Thanks, Take everyone. care. Have a good evening. Yeah, we'll see you. Bye.